Nowadays, scientific works are written in the various New Latin, Germanic, Slavic languages, etc. The Japanese, who used to write their works in English, now publish them in Japanese. For this reason, I recently received a work on elliptic functions from Mr. Kaba in Japanese. This is the start of one of the various writings of Giuseppe Piano on the question of an international language, and from the start we can immediately see how problematic the communication between scholars of different countries was at the time. I included this quote at the start of the video to better comprehend the struggle of scholars of the time. In fact nowadays, with English serving the purpose of an international language, we often forget that the problem of finding an international language for academic communication was actually a non-trivial one. After the slow downfall of Latin, each country started to produce academic texts in their own national languages. On one part, this greatly helped the national languages expand their horizons of communication as well as preserve and standardize their use. However, on the other, it greatly reduced the ability of academics to quickly communicate and spread their works on a global scale. In Italy, this process was also greatly aided by Galileo Galilei, who wrote both in Latin and in vulgar Italian. And being one of the first scientists to write treatises in Italian, in doing so, he introduced many adaptations of scientific words to Italian that formerly didn't exist. Now, going back to Latino Sineflexione, let's analyze some texts concerning the latter. One of the most important writings on the matter, the Latino Sineflexione, was written by Giuseppe Piano and published in 1904. In this text, the main rules and the motivation behind the artificial language called Latino Sineflexione are presented. Piano, however, didn't really claim the idea as his own. Citations to Leibniz and his manuscripts are frequent throughout the texts, and this suggests that Piano wanted the reader to know that what he was doing was just a continuation of Leibniz's work. However, we now ask the following question. What works by Leibniz was Piano citing exactly? In fact, Leibniz is known for a lot of things, but his contributions to linguistics and the question of an international language are not well known at all. This is because the manuscripts in which Leibniz covers the question were only discovered at the beginning of the 20th century by Professor Couturat. These fragments were then published in the volume Opuscule et Fragments Inédits de Leibniz. In these writings, many ideas regarding the simplification of the grammar of natural languages were presented as a basis for the creation of an, of an artificial language that could be easily learned by everyone. Leibniz, in fact, noticed that natural human languages evolve in a way which forced them to assume many unnecessarily complicated grammatical structures. One of the extreme examples of this is the Navajo language, which was employed as one of the languages used by code talkers during World War II due to its difficulty, especially for the extreme irregularity of the grammar as well as the affixes used to modify verbs and nouns. Now we provided an extreme example. However, even languages such as Russian, French or Spanish might be examples of languages with superfluous and unnecessary grammatical complications. These include noun declensions, and this is only present for Russian in this case, Grammatical gender, this is present in all four languages. Verb inflection, so conjugations, and in this case this is present in all four languages. And then grammatical number. As Piano noted in his work, in fact, there are languages such as Mandarin Chinese where grammatical number, noun declensions, grammatical gender, and verb inflection are not present. Yet Mandarin is an alive language that over one billion people can speak and comprehend without problems. Another such example is Indonesian. Now that we understand the historical background a little bit better, let's dive into the content of Piano's article. Lingua Latina fuit internationalis in omnis scientia, ab imperio romano, usque ad finem seculi octavo decimi. Hodie multi reputant illam nimis difficilem esse, iam in scientia magis in commercio. Sed non tota lingua latina est necessaria, parva pars sufficit ad exprimendam quam libet ideam. And the last part in particular, explains what the article will be about. In fact, it suggests that not all of the Latin language is actually necessary in order to make it into an unambiguous form of communication. And the article, in fact, introduces gradually all the simplifications that Piano, taking inspiration from Leibniz fragments, decides to employ for his Latino Sineflexione. All the simplifications that are introduced are then immediately adopted. The article starts in classical Latin, but every time one of these simplifications which we mentioned is introduced, it is immediately adopted. In this way, at the end of the article, the language we're reading is effectively not classical Latin anymore, but Latino Sineflexione. As the name suggests, Latino Sineflexione is a simplified version of Latin where declensions of verb conjugations are dropped, as well as grammatical number and gender. The first simplification is case. And Piano includes a quote by Leibniz, that is, Minum casus semper eliminari possunt, 
substitutis ineorum locum particulis quibusdam. Peano, in agreement with Leibniz, notices that in the present of cases, that is, inflections of the noun to specify the syntactic role of a noun in a preposition, are completely redundant. It is sufficient to use prepositions. In Latin, furthermore, but this is also present in Russian and other Slavic noun-inflected languages, sometimes prepositions even require some cases to be used. And this is an even more unnecessary complication, as you probably already experiment if you speak a Slavic or other noun-inflected language. Piano gives the following simplifications. Genitive will be indicated with the prefix de. The dative case will be indicated with ad. Ablative will be indicated with ab. And accusative and nominative cases will be clear by the construction of the preposition, using series such as subject-verb-object or object-subject-verb. The endings of nouns thus become unique and become o in most cases, becoming e if the nominative of the classical Latin noun ends in s. The second simplification employed is that of gender. Citing Leibniz, discrimen generis nihil pertinet at grammaticam rationalem. This means that the difference of genders of nouns is not a rational part of grammar. Piano justifies this reduction by noting that fundamentally there is nothing inherently masculine or feminine about a certain object or idea in most cases. And when there is, the specification can just be made by, without altering the noun, but just adding some further information. The first simplification is that of number. Citing Leibniz, videtur pluralis inutilis in lingua rationali. Piano, using mathematics as an example, notes that, that the specification of the number of a noun is not necessary. Since if a certain noun or object is presented in a certain discrete quantity, then we can just denote the quantity and the name of the object, like we do in mathematics when we say, for example, a, 2a, 3a, and so on. Finally, the last simplification is that of conjugations, so conjugations are removed. Citing Leibniz, persone verborum possunt esse invariabiles. Sufficit variari ego, tu, ille, etc. This basically means that if you want to indicate that a certain action is performed by me, by you, or by another person, you can just indicate it by using you did something and I do something and so on. So you can drop the different endings. And in English, an example would be the following. He watched a video. Then this is grammatically incorrect but an English native speaker will be able to understand just fine. This is because I specified that the person who committed the action is he. And thus, changing the ending of the verb in this case is superfluous. Leibniz's observation then allows us to drop different ver verb endings for the various singular and plural persons. But what about the specifications of the times? Piano notices that this can be done as well, since the specification of time can just be deduced from context. Imagine someone saying to you, I started learning English two months ago. And this is precisely how you would say it in Chinese. And this would be grammatically correct in Mandarin Chinese. This shows indeed that the time of the verb can be deduced from the context. In fact, if I said I started learning English two months ago, you would clearly be able to tell that the action happened in the past, even though it is not specified by an appropriate change of the verb. Now that we have seen the few rules of Latino Sineflexione, let's now see how it interacted with the other candidates for international languages, such as Esperanto and Volapük. In fact, Latino Sineflexione was introduced shortly after the creation of Esperanto by Zamenhof and Volapük by Schleier, two of the most well-known artificial languages for international communication. Piano covers this relationship in the first four pages of his text Il Latino quale lingua ausiliare internazionale. In Histoire de la langue universelle of Couturin and Lyot, 57 projects of artificial languages are analyzed, and great attention is devoted to Volapük, its rise and downfall. Piano suggests that the quick downfall of Volapük after the first illusory success was the arbitrary nature of the complicated grammar rules of the latter. The word Volapük, in fact, is still nowadays used in some languages to denote something that doesn't make sense. For example, in Russian, when, when you use the Russian Cyrillic alphabet letters that resemble Latin letters, to write something in Latin, it is sometimes called Volapük encoding. Il Volapük conteneva numerose convenzioni, non aventi altra ragion d'essere che la volontà del suo autore. For this reason, a great number of schisms between the Volapük community occurred, and the language ultimately became unused. Esperanto, while considerably easier, is criticized for similar reasons. It in fact possessed many grammatical constructions deemed to be unnecessary for a language in order to be mutually intelligible. Piano, in his text, analyzes other projects as well, such as that of the Idiom Neutral, 
Andy Panroman by Dr. Molinar. These languages, however, ended up resembling the modern Latin languages so much that eventually some academics, such as Professor Bramwell, came to the conclusion that directly adapting Italian as an international language would have been a faster option. With this said, I hope this video was helpful and I thank you for watching.